So good morning. I have uh, one good news for you, and that is that uh, this is the last lecture in the course. We've made it. It was easy, right? I mean, probably the most difficult thing was waking up early in the morning, as evident by the influx of people. Um, I hope that a lot more of you show up after the break so that we can have the course evaluation. The forms are over there. Well, let me... Um, fix the resolution again. Oh, and now I understand what the problem was. Oh, God. Just doesn't want to... F Keep it. Okay. Finally. So the forms over there, we'll do it after the break. I ask you to take them um, in the during the break. So take them at your desks during the break. And the first 15 minutes um, <coughs> in the, uh, of the second part will be spent on, on the course evaluations. I am obliged to say that the course evaluations are not so much about the lecture itself, but more about the lecturer. So most of the questions uh, will be evaluating the lecturer. So if you think that the course, if you have an opinion about the course material, that is the course is boring or not interesting or it could be improved and so on, you can write this down in the manual feedback section. But don't expect that uh, you get um, uh, questions evaluating the the course concept. This is evaluated uh, in a different way. All right. <coughs> so today's lecture continues kind of the what we started last time, and that is the business cycles, modeling business cycles. Um, <coughs> basically, this is the the same slide as as last lecture. Uh, a quick reminder: what we looked at so far was kind of a mathematical way to get oscillations, right? We looked at basically the nonlinear dynamics. We have a dynamical system. We didn't specify exactly what dynamical system that is. Could be everything. We looked at factory, supply chain, uh, for instance. And then we simply took control parameters and we saw how the um, dynamics of the system it changes qualitatively in terms of bifurcations by varying the control parameters, but um, <coughs> there was still kind of um, something left out, and that was more of a real application of these concepts in terms of economics. So that's the basically the last two lectures, the last three lectures actually, looking at uh, oscillations, looking at uh, uh, the economy as a dynamical system. Uh, and this is not something new. Economists have been trying to do this precisely to address criticism for the uh, equilibrium assumption that neoclassical economics has, and that is economy, economy is always in equilibrium, and um, all we can study actually is how the equilibrium changes if we change some, some fundamentals, right? Uh, obviously, this is not a satisfactory explanation of the real world, and that's why people started modeling business cycles. But I have to say that the economists who try to model business cycles, most of them, I would not like to say all of them because I'm not an economist, so I don't know, uh, um, I don't have all the information, but most of the economists are not neoclassical economists. Right? So we'll not, you will not find proponents of free markets, of uh, you know, efficient market hypothesis, you, you will not find someone, uh, an economist like Eugene Farmer, for instance, uh, studying business cycles, right? Because for neoclassical economics, there is no problem. If we're in a recession, for instance, there is not enough supply, uh, uh, there is not enough demand for labor, then what will happen is the wages will go down and eventually it will become profitable for employers to hire again and then the economy will bounce back. 
So there is no problem for, for neoclassical economists to explain recessions and, and, uh, and business cycles. But it's still not satisfactory. So all these economists, um, <coughs> starting actually quite a long time ago, 1938, they've been trying to kind of depart from this classical view. Uh, and that's what we emphasize here. This is not an economics course, but I'd just like to give you some kind of economics uh, foundation for, for doing this. It's not just because we like to have some mathematical equation and call this variable supply and this variable demand. Last lecture, I introduced the Calder trade cycle. It's one of the most famous business cycle models. I saved the economics behind it. It's written nicely in, in Calder's paper. Um, now I'm thinking that it may be a good idea to introduce the economics. Uh, so I will probably, well, introduce it briefly. So I will probably do it next, uh, next week at the summary lecture. I will introduce this um <coughs> quickly, these nonlinear functions, investments and savings functions, and explaining kind of the economic rationale behind the slopes and the shapes. Basically, it would be a summary of the Caldor's paper. It won't be new to you if you've read the paper. Today, we continue with more business cycle models. Um, and these are the models with the exception of, yeah, well, now, now I cannot use this, this tool. So let me, let me try to open the lecture in another way. Okay. Now I can do this right. These are the models we're going to be studying about, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, with the exception of the second one. Uh, it's just we don't have enough time. So all the others we're going to address uh, with the exception of the second one. So the first one, um, how many of you have heard the name Keynes, the, the economist? The economist. Oh, wow, nice. So you probably, you probably know his, um, <coughs> his economic idea, which is not as what popular opinion holds that he's a socialist or communist. He's actually trying to fix capitalism. So his main concept is that through fiscal politics, so government spending, public spending, you can fight recessions. Right? So if there is a recession and there is not enough private investment, so firms don't want to invest, don't want to hire, then it's the government who can step in. And I always think about all the construction work going around Zurich all the time. Uh, although, to me, they sound like perfectly, uh, they, they seem like perfectly good streets. Uh, but they're still being reconstructed. So, it could be, um, and probably it is some kind of uh, Keynes concept there. But he, this is his main idea. The government, through fiscal politics, can fight recession. Obviously, this is uh, at odds with the standard markets are most efficient, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so, um <coughs> well, Keynes was, targeted, was criticized a lot, especially by uh, Milton Friedman. He's another famous economist, uh, proponent of the efficient market hypothesis and so on, but that's irrelevant. The point is that all these models, if you want to model business cycles, you kind of assume Keynes' position. So all these models are just mathematical representations in one way or another of his ideas. Because actually he didn't leave any formal mathematical description of his ideas. So people are trying to formalize them. Of course, adding a little bit here and a little bit there. The first one is Samuelson. It's a very interesting model. Very simple, in fact. That's why it's interesting. So he simply assumes um, <coughs> that consumers always consume a fraction of their income. It's, this is called the multiplier concept. So um, you multiply kind of the, the income by a fraction, and this is what you consume at each time step. Um, investors, they invest a fraction of the increase of consumption. Right? So if consumption increases by, let's say, um, 1,000, arbitrary units, 
the increase or the, the differential in consumption, then investors would invest a fraction of this, uh, not, not, I mean, not a fraction, but a multiple of this. It could be larger than one. And this is called the accelerator. Uh, we'll see this in, in details. So the second model is, uh, well, just to give you an idea, the assumption here is that the economy grows trend-like, so there's a trend-like growth, but oscillation, I mean, uh, you don't see this trend uh, in the short term. You only see oscillations around the trend. So the economy grows like basically like this. Uh, John Hicks, it's an improvement of Samuelson model. We'll see what improvement exactly, and then uh, when you look back in, in this slide in retrospect, you will, you will understand what this means. And the Goodwin model is different from all these other models because it explains business cycles endogenously. Probably you're all familiar with exogenous versus endogenous. Only with the Goodwin model we can get business cycles that, that are produced by the internal dynamics of the system, not imposed by some uh, external parameter. We're going to see this. So Paul Samuelson, I tried to, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, this is a brand new lecture. So it was never given in the years before. Uh, so uh, these are kind of infant slides. And um, yesterday I was going through them again, and I found a lot of typos. So depending on when you downloaded the slides and printed them out, you may have a slightly different version. So to be safe, just download them again. They would be the correct ones. If you've downloaded them in the morning and printed them out just now, then you're fine. All right. Um, I, I tried to give you a little bit of information about each economist. So, for instance, uh, Paul Samuelson was already at university at the age of 16. You can read this, uh, you can read this at your leisure. Uh, he w he's the author of the best-selling economics textbook of all time. So that's, that has to count for something. All right, let's get right into the model. By the way, I forgot the other presenter, so I'll try to keep track of time with my, uh, with my cell phone. All right, so Keynes was originally, originally suggested the idea of the multiplier. And the multiplier is simply this. This is the multiplier. For historical reasons, a parameter like alpha was, uh, I mean, came to be called the multiplier, although it's just a fraction. I would call it a fraction, but nevertheless. So the idea is that consumers are backward looking. So they see what their income was in the previous time step, or last year, and they consume, and currently they consume a fraction of it. All right? And this is the multiplier effect. This is the original suggestion by, by Keynes. Now Samuelson came and he introduced also the idea of the accelerator. So another, for me, it's again just a parameter beta which could be called a fraction, but uh, yeah, it, for historical reasons it's called accelerator. So we have the multiplier here. This is consumption. Um, and the investment now is... Um, consists of two, of two parts, and you can recognize Keynes' uh, touch here. So investment consists of autonomous part, which is always there. You can think of this as government spending, constant government spending <coughs> at each time period. So it does not depend on the economic condition at the moment. It's always there. This is the autonomous part, and we assume it, it's a constant at each time period. And the induced investment, so the induced, in, uh, the induced, inve induced investment, this is the IT and subscript, uh, superscript IND, uh, this is what private investment is. So you induce capitalists to invest. And how are they induced? They're induced via the accelerator concept, this one here. So they see how much consumption or demand has increased over one time period, and they invest in production in order to satisfy this increase. Right? So they're not really extrapolating or, or doing some fancy statistics on, on the demand. Right? They just look at the most recent demand increase. Right? So if that is positive, then they would have to invest more 
in production in order to satisfy this expected demand. So that's the idea, accelerator and multiplier. And you can see how the two interplay. So if the government jump starts the process by investing something, and actually it's the next slide that I'll explain, in, explain it now, by investing something, consumption would increase, right, from zero, suddenly we have an output, an output generated entirely by the government investing. This is the autonomous part. Consumption, positive consumption would, so consumption would increase due to the multiplier. Then the increase in consumption would be kind of modulated via the accelerator and produce investment, induce investment actually. Induced investment would increase the output. Increasing the output increases consumption and this increases the differential here. Investment increases again, Consum output increases again, consumption increases again and so on and you can probably see where I'm going. It's an explosion. Right? And, and we'll see that this is in fact what can happen, what in fact happens. Um, and yeah, so this bullet point basically explains this, uh, this interplay. Samuelson just made a simple calculation, so he did not go through computer simulations, bifurcation diagrams, he just uh, made this l simple table. So here we have the current government expenditure, or well that is the autonomous part. Right? So here is the assumption that the government is providing at each time step something. So in the beginning, there is no consumption because there is no output, there is no investment, because there is no differential in consumption. The only thing that can happen is the government jump starts the process by investing, I think this is dollars, yes, by investing one dollar. It could be a bit confusing, but this is a one, it's not a capital I. So investing one dollar, the total, the total outcome or the total output would simply be one dollar, right? Remember, the output is equal to consumption plus investment. Consumption is zero, investment is simply the government investment here. So that's one dollar. So output is one dollar. Um, yeah, so I forgot to say that alpha is 0 0.5, so consu uh, consumers consume half of, the, of their income and uh, investors, they simply take the accelerator to be one. In the next time period, consumers would see, oh, we had one dollar of aggregate income, so this is aggregate. Uh, income, let's, let's consume half of it. We consume half of it. There is now a differential in consumption of 0.5. Therefore, the induced investment would be 0.5. The government still keeps investing $1. Therefore, the total outcome of the economy or output of the economy would be $2. And in the same way, you can go on and you see what happens to the total outcome. It grows grows and then it starts to decline, 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 and then it starts growing again, starts declining again. So you can probably already, uh, you can already spot that given these parameters of alpha and beta, we get kind of a cyclic behavior. In fact, this is not a cyclic behavior, these are damped oscillations. We'll see a phase plot later on. But this model can produce cyclic behavior at a very, very limited parameter range, which is one of its uh, deficiencies. Um, so you're probably wondering what, what does this mean minus 0 0.125. So this is uh, induced investment is negative. Right? This simply means that the investors for capitalists, they do not invest at all. They just simply let things depreciate. So that's why, in a sense, uh, some, some part of the capital good is lost because it gets depreciated and it's not covered by, by uh, induced investment. It is covered, though, by government investment, right? That's why the total investment can never be less than zero. Okay. <coughs> so this is a very simple description of the model. Let's look at how it, look, uh, how, how it behaves. Um, in a more systematic way. <coughs> As I said, the, out, the output of the economy is just equal to consumption plus investment. 
we can rewrite the investment in the following way autonomous part or government or uh, yeah kind of public spending plus induced private investment and by expressing the output uh, in terms of alpha and beta we get that here and we can substitute uh, <coughs> We can substitute the consumption. Remember, the consumption is equal to alpha times the output in the previous time step. So we can substitute this one, this one, and this one, and we get the second order di difference equation um, for the output. It's a non homogeneous equation because of this term. Anyway, in the notes, I've given you uh, the solution. We solved this equation exactly in the same way as I've shown in the previous lectures. Uh, we had different equations, and they are solved in exactly the same way. But here, I've given you just in the notes the the overall form of the solution, namely the x1. If you look, x1 and x2 are just given as the roots of this uh, polynomial because if I have to write them down, they would be very messy expressions, and we th this will simply confuse us. But if you just look at it, you can immediately see that if x1 and x2 are both negative we get we get what it's it's in the notes if x1 and x2 are negative what do we get do we get explosion no we get damped oscillations to the equilibrium value. Conversely, if they're positive, we get explosions. So only when they're kind of the interplay between x1 and x2 is 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 balances somehow balance them out, then you can get oscillations. But we'll see that this is in a very limited range. All right. So this is the equation. The stationary state is given by y bar. And you can calculate the stationary state easily by setting yt equal to yt minus 1 equal to yt minus 2. Right? This is what stationary state means. Um, <coughs> given the stationary state, we just compute the consumption, the st steady state or stationary consumption, which is just the multiplier, alpha times the, the stationary output, and the investment now. Yes? Uh, yo, yeah. Uh, alpha C T minus one. Oh, yeah. So there is another typo. So this should not be C, but it should be Y. Okay, it's simply what we're simply doing is consumption plus investment. Consumption should be alpha times y t minus one, and then this is the investment. Good, thank you. I'm impressed you were able to follow so fast. Yes, so um, right, this is why. Good. And now, why? So we see that this is the stationary state of the output. We can calculate the stationary state of consumption. Now, why would the stationary state of the investment or long-term investment, why would it be equal only to the autonomous investment, only to the government spending? Where is the induced part? We had an induced part, but now it's gone. So in the long term, there's no private investment. Why is that the case in this model? Let me just uh, show you the equation. This is the equation for the total investment. It's the sum of autonomous plus induced, and suddenly the long term investment is Autonomous, yes. 
Yes. <clears throat> yes. That's true. So it's precisely this. There is no differential anymore in consumption because we have a stationary consumption. It makes sense. And it can also be shown that this stable point or this stationary point is stable only if alpha is smaller than 1 over beta. Um, <coughs> More interesting is the phase plane, right? And this is in fact, so the phase plane, this figure without, so without these things is taken from the paper of Samuelson from Samuelson's paper, uh, and, and these kind of phase plots um, I added manually. So basically, uh, you when you simulate the model, you can create these phase plots. Uh, unfortunately, you can see the axis. This is simply phase plots. So on the, on the x-axis here, you have y of t, the output at time t. On the y-axis, you have the output at time t minus 1. Right? So this is the, the two... Um, most recent outputs. And what you can see is the following. Now on the y-axis of the large plot we have alpha. This is the part that consumers consume, the part of the output that consumers consume. Obviously it can never be larger than one. So if, if you look carefully there's like a bold black line at one. Consumers cannot consume more than it's what's available physically. Uh, beta on the other hand can go basically in any uh, any range. So in, in a sense this is kind of the reaction of investors. If beta is very high they really overreact to any differential, any small differential. If it's small they're not sensitive at all. So what we see is the following. By the way, uh, I've tried to do it uh, to put the plots where in the regions where they belong. For instance in the region B, region B is basically everything below these curves. This is region B. The dynamics looks like this. At region C, which is simply the, the space, the area between these two curves, is this one. Region D is the area between the horizontal line one at one and this. And now region A is just this little thing here. This little area. But I couldn't put, uh, I couldn't put this plot here, so have in mind that this plot refers to region A. It's not that this plot refers to values of alpha which are bigger than 1, which obviously doesn't make sense. So what we see, and what you cannot see, unfortunately, uh, these little arrows, I hope you can see them, but this arrow, this arrow, and... Yes, so this arrow and this arrow, they point downward. So the dynamic starts from here and it finishes here. Here the dynamic starts from here and ends up here. This one starts from here and explodes. Uh, no, sorry. This one starts from here and again goes to a stable state like that. And this one simply increases all the time. So the arrow points upright. So what we s basically what you can see is that for most of the parameter ranges, if, if not, yeah, for most of them, you either get damped oscillations like region A, B, and C, or exploding oscillations, which is region D. That's, that's the only thing you get. Only when alpha equals 1 over beta, which is that line, uh, th this line here, basically this one, this, this line. So this is when alpha is equal to 1 over beta. Only then do you get oscillations. And I've put the plot there. You can see there are oscillations there. So it's kind of a business cycle model, but it produces business cycles is kind of an exception, right? In most cases, it either explodes or dies down. And that motivates a lot of the critical points on this slide. So, uh, namely the, the third bullet point. Business cycles are only 
uh, a boundary case. But moreover, um, <coughs> the cycles have a fixed duration and fixed amplitude. You can show that. Which is obviously, again, not realistic. Real economic cycles, you can claim they more or less have an average period of, I don't know, four or five years, but it's by no means fixed, or the amplitude is by no means fixed. Yet in this model they are. Um, the marginal, so the beta, if you think about the, uh, no, sorry, if you think about the alpha again, let's, uh, let's go back just to show you. Right, if you think about the alpha again, you can interpret alpha also as the marginal propensity to consume, right? If you differentiate this thing um <coughs> with respect to consumption, then you get the marginal propensity to consume is alpha. Uh, yeah, so one unit of output induces alpha times this unit, uh, units of consumption. It's constant in the model, right? Alpha is constant, but of course this is not again really realistic. We know that actually it's been shown that as people become more wealthy and wealthy their consumption kind of saturates at some point. There's only so much they can physically consume. So alpha is by no means constant in the real economy. Um <coughs> yes, so everything else I said. Um, and I've, I've said here that as a response uh, the nonlinear Hicks model was developed. Now, why is it nonlinear? Or, in other words, why is this model linear? If you look at the equation for the yt, uh, so yt equal uh, as, uh, <coughs> as a function of yt minus 1 and yt minus 2, you would see that it has linear coefficients, so it's a linear model. Therefore, John Hicks developed a nonlinear model, mm, which is an extension of this one, and he tried to address these critical points, some of them, not all you'll see that some of these points still remain in the Hicks model. So this is uh, John Hicks. In fact, I should have said Sir John Hicks because he was knighted uh, in his lifetime. But this is the model. So his idea was very simple. He said, well, I mean, it's kind of a first order solution if you'd like to think about it in this way. He saw that the Samuelson model produces explosions or or complete uh, kind of um, convergence to, to zero or to the autonomous investment. So he said, well, let's introduce upper bound and lower bound for investment and for output. So one way, one very easy way to prevent explosion of output is just to limit it artificially. Well, of course, he was a bit smarter than this. He just... He didn't just say, let's limit it artificially. He tried to give economic meaning for these bounds. Uh, and you can think about it in the following way. Well, I think, yes, I will explain the bounds uh, in the next slide. So the idea was the following. For Hicks now, the investment was still a sum of autonomous investment, but now, it's not a big difference actually, now the induced investment, so investors do not respond to, to differential in consumption, they respond to differential in output. It's just a kind of a generalization of this idea that investors respond to a differential of economic activity. You can measure economic activity in terms of consumption or in terms of GDP, for instance. So here is GDP. So it's the gross or GNP um <coughs> if if you don't have uh, trade so um right so this is how the investment looks like for hicks consumption is still the same still uh, the same multiplier model and then uh if you just do the exercise um of expressing output uh as a difference equation you get this this is without the bounds so there are no upper and lower bounds to the output. This thing can still explode or die down. All right. So this is what actually Hicks said. This is the private investment or the induced investment. Or rather, let's say at uh, let's first look at the output. This is the output. 
he puts an upper bound to the output, which is called YC. C stands for ceiling, by the way. Right? So the output can never be bigger than the, than the ceiling. Now, what could be an economic reasoning for introducing a ceiling on the economic activity? What do you think? Yes, so, yeah, basically that's the economic reasoning. There's only so much investment you can do. At some point, uh, making new investments is not profitable, right? It's the so-called diseconomies of scale, right? You're limited, your resources are limited. Employment, so employment is limited. The physically, the amount of people you can hire is limited. Natural raw materials are limited, so there is a limitation to production, which you hit at some point. In fact, this is one of the criticisms of, th of this model, that uh, yes, in principle, it is possible that we hit this kind of, as you said, structural limit to investment, uh, but w we're not sure if we can ev uh, ever reach it in real life. Right? Because the examples when people have not been able to invest because they couldn't hire more people physically or because they couldn't get more raw materials uh, are not so many at all. So, but that's, that's for later. For now, um, this is the ceiling. Now, his idea for, for a floor on investment is the following. So F stands for floor. You see the induced investment or the private investment can never be lower than this floor. And this floor is negative. So the idea was the following. Um, you have some kind of capital goods, a certain amount of capital goods. Let's say you have 10 factories, for instance. At each time period, they depreciate, as you all know. So there is depreciation. Um, <coughs> if you do not cover this depreciation, you're kind of, or, or let's say, yeah, so the idea was this. If you do not cover this depreciation, at all, so you invest nothing. Um, you're kind of, let's say, this is the worst thing you can do. In the sense that um, if you don't cover your depreciation and then, in addition, you sell some of your factories, this would be equivalent to actively destroying capital. This was Hicks' idea. And he didn't think that on the aggregate, people or capitalists actively destroy capital. So if the output um, if the output goes down, if the differential in the output goes down, let's look at this. This is the accelerator. So if this is negative, which means that the output goes down, there is a recession, this tells you that you have to disinvest. Disinvest meaning negative private investment, so you kind of sell your capital goods on the market. But if you need to disinvest more than your depreciation, this would amount uh, to actively destroying capital. And, and Hicks didn't think that this is uh, what people do on the aggregate. It may happen that individual people indeed not only let their machines depreciate, but they also sell them, disinvest them. But on the aggregate, he didn't think this is the case. So if you see a recession if you're a capitalist and you see a recession the worst thing that you can do is to refrain from investment so just sit let your depreciation go let your depreciation go so the the worst disinvestment that you can do is your depreciation not worse on the aggregate that is that's that's how hicks reasoned uh, for this floor of the investment is that clear? Because it, it, it kind of, it, 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 at first sight, it looks counterintuitive. Why shouldn't I be allowed not only to not cover my depreciation costs, but also to sell everything I want? You are allowed to, but on the aggregate, Hicks argued that this doesn't happen. So people just, on the aggregate, they just let their things depreciate, even though according to the accelerator model, they should have actually sold them as well. 
All right. So now, this is, this, is, this is how the economy looks like for Hicks. This is the induced investment, and now you can immediately see what happens. I will just walk you through the business cycle creation. Let's say we have a boom, right? So economic, economic activity rises, it rises, investment rises, consumption rises, everything is fine. At some point, we hit this ceiling of output. So let's say for two periods, two consecutive periods, we hit the ceiling. What investors would see is no differential here. At some point, they would see no differential because we hit the ceiling twice. This equation would tell them that their private investment has to be zero. So they invest basically nothing. They let things, uh, they only cover their depreciation. That is the point. So zero induced investment means addition to the capital goods, but they still cover their depreciation. So that is zero. If the new investment, in induced investment is zero, the total investment in the economy would decrease. If the total investment of the economy decreases, the output in the next time period would also decrease because the output is the sum of investment plus consumption. When the output decreases, then this difference in the next next time period becomes negative. It's not zero anymore, it's negative. So now depending on the value of the accelerator, if is negative but not smaller than the depreciation, it means that capitalists, they still disinvest some of their capital goods, they sell them, but the amount they kind of disinvest is not larger than the depreciation. If at some point this thing, the amount they have to disinvest, becomes larger than, the de than their depreciation, they don't disinvest, they just simply don't cover their depreciation. So the, this is the depreciation of, of, of capital minus IF. So the investment, the induced investment would be negative, so depreciation is not covered, but together with the autonomous investment, remember government is spending all the time, it makes the total investment zero, exactly zero. All right, And this is in fact uh, the definition of the floor. The floor, when you hit the floor, the total investment is zero. In other words, this equals this in order for, for the total investment to be zero. So you've hit the floor, total investment becomes zero, um, and yeah, so this is the cycle. You have to implement this in Vensim, so um <coughs> you, you get a much better intuition how it, how it works with the ceiling and the floor. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, this is a new kind of a self-study, so I still haven't done the Vensim models, there are two models that you have to develop. It's the Higgs model and, and uh, one more that you'll see. So I still don't know if it's possible, but I assume it is. So uh, let's see. All right, we'll continue after the break. And let me just remind you, please come and pick up the evaluation forms, course evaluation forms in the break just put them on your desks and we will evaluate the course uh, after the break, actually. So you, you don't sacrifice the break. All right, guys, let's, let's resume. Um, before we go into the course evaluation, I have a few announcements to make. One of them, oh, no, no, no. Yes, I was about to shut off the beamer instead of just doing this. One of them is an appeal from... Group V member Laura, she's looking for her group members. So if group members could raise their hands, who is in group V? So only you two guys for now. So you can sync later. All right, now the third online quiz. Remember we have a third online quiz? Some of you need to pass it. Um, the third online quiz will most likely be, uh, go online on Saturday or Sunday. 
and you have one week maximum to do it because I need to know who's going to get the testat and who's not going to get the testat uh, in advance and communicate this to the department. So um, expect expect an email in the weekend, Sunday at the latest, yeah. Um, with this, let's go to the course evaluation. This is the information you need to put in. This is the course number. I hope you can read it. These are zeros and not big O's. And the optional thing is this. And let's say we can spend about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes on this, on, on the evaluation. I mean, don't overthink it. Just be honest. <laughs> yes. Really? Uh, one sec. Yes, yeah, so basically, let me see. It should fit. Three, five, one. No, five, four, one. Uh, well, this is what they gave me. Okay. I trust you then. <laughs> All right. So don't put the L. Does it fit now? Okay. Let me see if I'm obliged to say something else. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, it's, it's about me. It's not about the lecture. That's what I have to tell you. But you can still put your opinion about the lecture in the manual feedback.
If you're finished, please bring the forms here. Or let's try to collect them in a more intelligent way. Just, I don't know, how should we do it? Pass them on? No, I just bring them here. Thank you. Time's up. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you. They're anonymous as a I forgot to mention. Guys are done. Does it work? Because I already tried. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's resume. So we were I was describing the Higgs model. <coughs> the economy in Higgs model is given in the Higgs model is given by these four equations. Thank you. And the most notable thing to notice are the two upper bound the upper the two bounds, the upper bound and the lower bound. The upper bound is on the output and the lower bound is on the investment. Once again, let me reiterate, there is only so much output that we can produce physically and there's only so much disinvestment that we can do without actively destroying capital which Hicks argued rational investors do not do they simply refrain from investment now if you calculate the steady state by the way these are as, as long as soon as you have max and min you have piecewise linear functions. Oh, this is not linear in this case, but you have piecewise functions. Uh, doesn't, don't concern yourselves with this. Uh, the point is that mathematically this model has not been fully analyzed yet. It's simply complicated. So um, papers come out all the time finding some exotic behavior of this model, which is more of a theoretical importance than any real practical consequences uh, just as a side information so if we express the output in the same way as we did before in terms of the output in the previous two time steps so we get the difference equations you get the equation number one this is the yt if you set yt equals to yt minus one um, to get the steady state uh, or fixed point 
you get the YFP, which is this. Right, so obviously if there is no government spending at all, meaning the autonomous investment is zero, uh, then the steady state is zero. So this, this, this model cannot support basically any economy unless you have government spending. That's the fixed point. It can still have oscillations around the zero fixed point. That's a different issue. So the two bounces, I described them. The first one is the um, so-called full employment bound on the output. So as, as soon as we have full employment in the economy, we cannot produce more. This is as simple as that. Even though uh, there is investment and there is consumption, increasing consumption, increasing investment, we cannot keep producing more because we have uh, basically diseconomies of scale. As, as mentioned here, labor force, raw materials, and so on. The lower bound is the so-called investment, lower bound on investment. What this means is, um, is explained here, when the output decreases too fast, which would indicate, according to the accelerator, that investment, or rather disinvestment, have to increase more than depreciation. In other words, not only will you not cover your depreciation, but you will also disinvest more. Um, this would be equivalent to actively destroying capital on the aggregate, which Hicks argued does not, does not happen. And people seem to agree with him. All right. Um, the analysis of the Hicks model, we're not going to do any mathematical analysis, but just, just, as a, um, just to let you know that this has been done, and people have managed to prove uh, so this is a theorem, you don't need to understand it. What this says is basically there is, it could be proven that there is a so-called closed set, or think about it as a space, or, or, or bounded region of space, where this model, the dynamics of this model resides. All right. So the f any fluctuations that emerge are bound, or bounded, within a confined region of space, and this is called K. It's a closed curve, anyway. Right, so you don't get, you can prove what this means is there are no exploding oscillations. Uh, there, is no, there is no exploding regime. Right, if there was an explosion, you wouldn't be able to bound the dynamics in any finite region of space. All right, so this is the proof, mathematical proof, uh, that now we don't have, uh, we don't have um, explo uh, explosions. All right, so what are, yes, so what are the consequences of this so-called theorem? Um, as I mentioned, this proves that business cycles exist because the dynamics are confined. Um <coughs> right, so another good uh, outcome of this model is that fluctuations can be either periodic or quasi-periodic, which is nice because we know that in real life business cycles are not perfectly periodic. And in Samuelson model we always got perfect peri uh, periodicity. Now, I've simulated the model uh, with R. Not, this is not Vens these are not Vensim graphs, but R graphs. You will have to produce Vensim graphs like these. Um, <coughs> this is for the next, next week. Right? Next Tuesday, we have um, the Calder model. Anyway, so what you can see is depending on the, on the parameters, the multiplier alpha and the accelerator beta, you can get damped oscillations. So on, on, the y, uh, on the upper plot, you have time versus the output. Right. The hmm. OK, so if I wanted to be consistent, I would have put all these time graphs on top. But apparently, I didn't want to be consistent. I don't know why. Anyway, so um, this is the time development of the output. You can see it's damped oscillations, the corresponding phase plot, which is just y at time t divide, uh, versus y at time t minus 1, is eventually reaching this attractor, this attracting point. These are the so-called quasi-periodic or aperiodic cycles. So there is no clearly defined period of these cycles, but they're still bounded which is nice, 
And by looking at, by seeing this in the phase plot, these fluctuations, you can, you can tell that they're aperiodic. It looks like this. They look periodic, but in fact, if you look carefully, they're not. And periodic cycles, depending on the, on the parameters for this alpha and this beta. As you can probably guess, the next logical sequence in the lecture is to criticize this model. Right? We introduced the Samuelson model, we criticized it, and we saw why the Higgs model needed to be developed, namely to address this explosion. Now we address some, uh, we, we address some criticism for the Higgs model. Some of the criticism still remains from Samuelson, namely the alpha and beta, the multiply and the accelerator, are constant which is again not realistic. Um, <coughs> More importantly, however, people have managed to show that the existence of upper bound is not necessary to produce oscillations. Even if you disregard this, uh, this point, then you can criticize it further by saying existence of upper, of upper bound is not even realistically provable. We can never prove that this upper bound exists, and even if it does, we can never we, we can never prove that we'll reach it, right? Um, <coughs> on the aggregate, that is. And why is that a, like a criti uh, point of criticism? Well, people have observed that in none of the cycles in real life, up to 1980 when this model was developed, and even now none of the business cycles were caused by hitting an upper bound. By full employment, for instance, people not being able to employ, capitalists not being able to employ more workers or running out of raw material. So none of the business cycles have been caused by an upper bound. So we may never reach it, even if it exists. It's like this equilibrium concept. It may exist, but we may never reach it. And it's not even known whether we can reach it uh, at all. Right. Um, I had a short discussion in the break about uh, investor behavior. And uh, remember, here the reasoning was that as investment, as output goes down, so there is a recession, investors just refrain from investment. They just let depreciation work. Um, what happens sometimes, well, often in real life, is exactly when there's a recession, people invest because the cost of investment is cheaper. And then they can, yeah, so basically they can increase their capital stock uh, and be at an, ad at an advantageous position when the boom comes. This is not what happens here because there is no anticipation included of investment behavior. So investors do not anticipate the ensuing boom after recession. Um, that, that's a valid criticism, obviously. Most importantly, however, in all these models, even if you kind of decide to overlook all these points so far, cyclic behavior is generated exogenously. So we impose these parameters alpha and beta on the system. Who is to say uh, what's, what's the multiplier effect for consumers? Well, we just pick up a value, we see a business cycle, and that's it. But it's an exogenous effect, and we don't like this. Uh, we'd like to have an endogenous effect, and that's why the next model was introduced by Richard Goodwin. It's an endogenously generated business cycle. Uh, so a short introduction for this guy. Um <coughs> The most important probably is the second point. He is one of the founders of endogenously uh, modeling, uh, endogenous models of business cycles. Um, <coughs> let's get right into the model. So his model is a little bit uh, different in the sense that to generate endogenous business cycles, um, <coughs> you need to introduce more dynamics in the model. Right? So far, in these models, we only had basically dynamics in consumption, 
and in output. But now he said the following. Think of two social classes, capitalists and workers, like the Calder model. Um, the workers get uh, some wage, W. This is the real wage, that's important. It's not the nominal wage, it's the real wage, so adjusted to inflation. L is the number of people employed. So, I mean, it may be a bit confusing when it says employment, but it's the number of people employed. Then obviously, mu is the share of output that goes to cover costs of labor, so salaries, you may think, for all the employers, right? So W times L is simply the total salary of all the employers, uh, of all the employees, divided by the output is the total share of output that goes to, to cover these costs. And um <coughs> L over N is the share, is the employment rate. Okay, so the, yeah, it's self-explanatory. Now, um, Capitalists, the two more assumption is that capitalists always invest everything they get. So they, the capitalists get some profit, they save everything, and by kind of assumption of classical economics, savings are used for investment. You know, they're not used to just have cash in the bank, but they're used for investment. So all the profits are reinvested back into the economy. This is what it means, propensity to save is one. Basically, they always save everything, and in turn, everything is invested. By kind of uh, extension, consumers consume everything. So the consumers consume entirely uh, their income. And now if you, re if you write down a little bit the equations for savings and investments, so as I said, savings of capitalists is equal to their investments, so they invest all their savings. Um, <coughs> this investment goes to increase the capital stock, right? So K dot increases by the amount of investment. And here, if you remember the solo model, we have not included depreciation of capital. In the original Goodwin model, he did not include depreciation. Um, so all the investment goes to cover, uh, to increase the capital stock. And then if you express um uh, where is it right so if you um right so this ba so basically the investment would be the investment of of capitalists would be their earnings minus the s the amount they pay to workers and that would be the the stuff that is left for investment so that's what they invest so basically this is an equation linking k dot with with uh, output and w and l further assumptions these are a bit more economic assumptions now and uh, they would require a bit more explanation now h how many of you have heard of the phillips curve mm, quite a lot yes this, this is a standard standard uh, um, relationship between unemployment and inflation um, and this is a linear Phillips curve, right? Most of you know this kind of non-linear, or rather like this non-linear li uh, Phillips curve, but this is a linear Phillips, Phillips curve. What does this mean? This is the increase, the relative increase, because we divide by W, of the wage, of the real wage, right? So in other words, the percentage increase of the real wage, this one here. And the reasoning goes as follows. At times of full employment, so this was the employment rate, remember? At times of full employment, uh, workers have more bargaining power, right? Because they can, they can argue, well, uh, if you fire me, or if you don't increase my salary, I will, I will leave and you will have troubles hiring somebody else because we have full employment already. So when the employment rate is high, the, real, the increase in real wages is also, also high, right? Because workers have more bargaining power. If we have a lot of unemployment, so basically the employment rate is very low, 
then workers' bargaining power decreases. Right? There is a lot more substitute for these workers available out of the unemployed population. Therefore, when this thing decreases, the real wage uh, also decreases. So if you, if you look at this, this is a curve which basically goes like this. So on the x-axis you have, um, you have uh, the employment rate, on the y-axis you have the relative increase in real wage and it goes like that. So when the employment rate increases, bargaining power of workers increase and real wage also increases. So this is the assumption for the rate of change, the relative rate of change of the real wage. Uh, typical assumption is that capital output ratio is constant. So basically, w what does this mean, actually? Capital output ratio is constant. It means that out of, at each time period, a fixed proportion of the output is always capital. Right, so if the output increases, the capital goods, meaning machines, factories, and all this kind of stuff, also increase. All right, and you immediately see a deficiency in the model. There is no technological progress, no innovation. In real life, we know that due to innovations, the productivity of capital increase. So the productivity of a machine may increase and produce more output than before. But according to this, the only way to increase output is to buy another machine because the productivity of the machine is fixed. There is no innovation. I just cannot refrain from, uh, or kind of restrain from uh, introducing critic, uh, criticism as I introduce the model, but we have a separate slide for the critical points. All right, labor productivity now, this is a more realistic assumption, uh, grows at a constant rate. Okay, so this is the amount of people employed. This is the rate that labor productivity grows. It's alpha, right? So for a fixed, for a fixed amount of people, if that is positive, the output would increase over time, because over time, at each time period, the productivity of each single employee increases. As people become more specialized and more adept at doing their jobs, uh, this assumption is somehow justified. And, well, yes, the population grows at a constant rate. And uh, this is the rate n. It's kind of an exponential growth of population. I believe that's not so unrealistic, especially today. Probably, if you want to improve the model, you can introduce some kind of uh, um, carrying capacity restraints, like in the rabbit and fox model. So you can introduce some S-curve, but um, for now, let's keep it simple. These are the basic dynamics. So let me ask you, in your opinion, what are the control parameters in this model? What are good candidates for the control parameters? Let me remind you, uh, this is the complete model. So we have mu is the weight share, V is the employment rate, um, and then we have all these other things here. Sigma, alpha, and n. Because what we want to do is now to define a dynamical system which relates our control parameters. And remember, control parameters are those that can be changed relatively easily. Well, yes, relatively easily by policy, for instance. It's not actually so um, easy, or let's say so intuitive this time. Turns out control good candidates for control parameters are the weight share of output, so mu, this one which means how much of your output goes to cover the la labor costs. In other words, you can change W, the salaries. And V, this is the employment rate. These are things that change most, most often. So what we want to do now is to have two equations, two dynamical equations, coupled differential equations, relating 
mu and v. This is what we want. Now, I'll show you how to get a dynamical equation, uh, a differential equation, uh, relating mu dot, so the rate of change of mu and and um, v, the employment rate. In the exactly the same way as an exercise, if you'd like, it will not be asked on the exam. You can derive the second differential equation relating v dot, v dot to mu. The only thing we do, the only thing you need to know is the uh, chain rule for differentiation. That's all you need to know. This is the whole exercise. Well, let's see. Mu was defined as this. So if you want an expression for mu dot, you simply have to differentiate that thing. You have to differentiate this thing. Well, what is the, with respect to time, okay? What is the derivative of this? It's the, so think of this as w times L over Y. Well, let's look. It's the derivative of W times L over Y plus W times the derivative of L over Y. It's the chain rule. Right? So uh, by the way, this dot refers to the derivative of this of this ratio here, not just to the der derivative of L divided by Y. So if if you don't want to be confused, maybe you can put a bar here or you can put a prime here like I've put it here. Anyway, then we continue expressing it. This, is, this remains the same. The derivative of this whole fraction, L over Y, remember L over Y was defined, or rather Y over L was defined as the growth of labor productivity. It was E to the power of l alpha times T in the previous slide. Well, L over Y then would be just 1 over E to the power of alpha T or E minus to the power of minus alpha T. Derivative of this, well, that's easy. Derivative of an exponential is simply the exponential itself times the derivative of this thing, which is minus alpha. Therefore, we get W alpha E remains minus. This thing still remains the same. This is the same. Now, E to the this exponent is simply L over Y. L over Y. We can factor L over Y. Um, yeah, so we can factor it out in front of brackets and rewrite this expression like this. Okay? So if you multiply the brackets out, you would get exactly the left-hand side. What is that, though? Well, this was defined as the rate of change of the relative wage, which was simply the linear Phillips curve, this one, minus alpha times this is mu. It's the amount you pay to all your employees divided by the output, so the rate, uh, the, rage, the share of output that goes to cover your labor costs, so it's mu. Therefore, we get a differential equation relating mu dot and uh, obviously mu, but also v. Obviously, <coughs> uh, in the same way you can go with the, with the v, I will not do it now uh, to save time, but it looks like, th like the one shown. So basically our system now is these two coupled differential equations. And you know how to analyze it. First we try to find the fixed points, and then we try to find uh, to investigate the stability of these fixed points. We already did this in lecture 10, I believe, where we were looking at uh, Jacobians and stuff like that. So one obvious fixed point, so I just set these two derivatives to zero, one obvious fixed point is zero, zero, right? If mu is zero and v is zero, everything is fine. The derivatives are zero. This is a trivial fixed point. So we're not so interested in it. Another fixed point would be obviously when the expression in the brackets are zero, this one and this one, right? So when this is zero only when v is equal to alpha plus gamma divided by rho, this one. In the same way, this is zero only when mu is equal to this. So this is another fixed point. 
And now we can calculate the Jacobian of our system. Introducing lecture 10. So the, the Jacobian in general, the Jacobian in general is given by this. What does it mean in general? So not evaluated at the fixed point, but just taking the differential. So remember, this is uh, du. Uh, so we differentiate this thing with respect to mu, and we get the upper left entry in the Jacobian. This thing with respect to v differentiated this thing with respect to V differentiated, we get the upper right entry and so on. If we evaluate the Jacobian at the non-trivial fixed point, so not the zero, zero, but the other one that we found, the Jacobian equals to this. By the way, I'm sure there are no typos here because I just did it manually without trusting that people who did it two years ago did it right. So this is the Jacobian at the non-trivial fixed point. We do this, why? To analyze the stability of the fixed point. Turns out that the trace is zero. The trace is simply the sum of these two diagonal elements. It's zero, the determinant is positive. It can be shown. If you calculate it, the determinant is positive. And now if you go back to lecture 10 and look at the um, illustration uh, which relates the determinant, the trace, and the types of fixed points, then you can see that given these conditions, the fixed point is a center. Okay, what does a center mean? Uh, you'll see, I believe, on the next plot. Well, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, they're always building something. All right. <coughs> this is what a center means. Now, this is our fixed point. Our fixed point is here. If we just disturb it a little bit, randomly, we get orbits, increasing orbits. Well, it's kind of difficult to be very precise with this, but imagine kind of a spiral, increasing spiral, increasing spiral, which eventually settles down to this center, or this circle, this one. OK? Now, if we're at this, uh, at this center and we disturb it a little bit, and just by chance, we disturb it uh, in, in a way that now the dynamics is here, a bit up, then again an increasing spiral would go to the second circle, and so on. So starting from a fixed point, we end up in one of these circles, one of these many infinite number of circles depending on the shock. And obviously, depending on, on initial conditions, right? If the initial condition is here, if we start with the initial condition here, obviously, we're going to converge to that circle. So that's what the center means. And this is nothing else but a business cycle, right? Look, mu on the v-axis, we have, uh, well, on the, on the x-axis, we have mu. On the y-axis, we have v. So what happens is uh, the rate the rage, the um, <coughs> the share of output which goes to employment and the employment rate fluctuate. That's another way to uh, to quantify a business cycle. Instead of looking at output, how output oscillates, you can just look at employment rate and salaries. Right. So employ if when empl employment rate increases. Look at it here. When the employment, well, f uh, let's look at, let's look at this circle. The salaries increase here. Employment rate also increases. That's this assumption that when employment rate increases, bargaining power of empl of, of workers also increase. Therefore, their their uh, salaries would increase as well. Right. So, employment rate increases, bargaining power increases. Salaries increase too, so range, uh, share of output that goes to salaries increase. At some point, however, the opposite happens. The salaries decrease, whereas the employment rate increases. So that's kind of a predator-prey dynamics, 
that we saw with the rabbits and foxes. Well, it's not exactly predator prey, it's like predator prey. So these are the business cycles. And again, some criticism. Um, it turns out that if you introduce just small fluctuations in the model, very small, but which are nevertheless economically meaningful. And for instance, I've given an example. Um, if the capitalist's propensity to save is not one, so it's not the fact that everything they get, they save it and invest it, but if it's a decreasing function of the wage share, meaning the more they have to pay to, employer, to, em to workers, the less they would save. For instance, they would keep some money in the bank. Let's put it this way. They would not invest everything they get. Uh, then the fixed point becomes <laughs> asymptotically stable and there are no business cycles anymore. Right? So this is kind of a, a little disturbance in the assumptions of the model which completely changes its behavior. That's one criticism. Second criticism is um, people have shown empirically that it is possible uh, that this happens. So labor productivity and, and <coughs> the sum of the labor, well, the increase of labor productivity and uh, population to be negative. If that is true, we get this. Then the fixed point, this is the fixed share of output that goes to salaries becomes larger than one, which makes no sense economically. Right? You cannot pay more salaries that you have money available. So that makes no sense. Uh, the same thing can be shown that happens with V. So um, this model is not stable in a sense. Two empirical data, that's the most impressive thing. Or let's say the worst thing. All right, we're almost at the end. Well, I still have one minute, so let's keep this uh, this clock. Um, I just want to mention a few general assumptions about the multiplier accelerated theory. You know, this this th all the models so far, except the last one, had multiplier and accelerator in it. And I've tried to summarize kind of the most important ones. First of all, both acceler accelerator and multiplier assume that um, <coughs> investment or supply is very elastic. So if you want to ramp up production, ramp down production as response in response to supply or output differential, you can do this immediately, which is obviously not realistic. Um, furthermore, the, the accelerator assumes underemployment. Underemployment. Why? Because if you need to increase production rapidly, you need to be able to hire people at ease. So there must be some unemployed people just waiting for you to hire them if you want to increase production. Right? If there are no unemployed people available, you won't be able, able to increase production. Yet, the accelerator concept by itself requires this in order f for it to work. Another thing is there must be no unused capacity. So all capacity must be utilized at all times. Why is that? Well, if there is unused capacity, let's say five of your factories are not working, when you see a, uh, a differential in consumption or a differential in output, you will not make new investments to build new capacity. You, you will just reuse, or you, you will just use some of this unused capacity. So there would be no new investments, yet you will be able to produce more. And this is only possible if there is, there is unused capacity. Therefore, the accelerator concept assumes all capacity is utilized at all points of time, which is again not perfectly realistic. I mentioned it already. Both of these concepts completely neglect expectations. They were, you know, we had very backward, very simple backward looking consumers. They only cared about their last salaries and we had very backward, very limited 
uh, investor, investors who only cared about the differential in the last two periods. There is no forward looking in any way. Both accelerator and multiplier are constants. Um, yes. Yes, so these are the most important assumptions of the multiplier accelerator theory, and depending on your personal preferences, you may or may not relax them, uh, so disregard them in other words, or you, you might just completely disregard uh, all, these, all these theories by saying they're completely economically not realistic. But uh, it's basically personal taste, I would say. This is the last self-study. You have to implement the Hicks and the Goodwin models in Vensim. As I mentioned, this is a new self-study. I myself haven't done it yet. I assume it's possible. It doesn't look difficult. Um, so let's hope I'm right. Thank you, and I'll see you next. Ah, by the way, something important, sorry. Uh, for next week is the Q&A session. Please come with you know, your questions and, and try to, to, to just ask me, like, uh, lecture 10, slide 19, this graph I don't understand. Let's keep try to keep it short and concise so that there can be as many questions as possible. All right, see you next week.